my name is Michal. I'm a software engineer at Software Mansion, specifically at Membrane Framework, where I'm working on WebRTC for over three years. And today's presentation is going to be about rewriting Pion in Elixir. So I divided my presentation into three parts. The first one, very short introduction. Uh, the second one, current Elixir WebRTC project status. And the third one, Ryber's presentation. So uh, let's start with a short introduction. What is WebRTC? So WebRTC is a standard that allows you to create peer-to-peer -peer, uh, multimedia sessions to exchange your audio and video in uh, real time, so below 200 of milliseconds. It's natively implemented by all major browsers, meaning that you, can, you are provided with WebRTC API um, in your JavaScript code without using any plugins. It's peer-to-peer -peer oriented. So WebRTC is always about singular connection. On top of WebRTC, there are multimedia servers, so-called SFUs, where you can create a um, video conferencing room where multiple people can talk to each other. And it's complex but powerful. On the one hand, we have a pretty high-level API for adding, removing, or in general, managing tracks. But on the other hand, we have a pretty low-level API where WebRTC developer has to, for example, provide its own signaling server. This diagram shows a uh, WebRTC protocol stack. So we have over 10 different protocols that we have to implement to fully support WebRTC. Everything above UDP uh, are protocols that we, we need to implement. And today we are going to talk about STAN, TERN, and ICE. So three protocols that are used to establish peer-to-peer -peer connection. WebRTC is a standard, and Pion is its implementation written in Go. Uh, it implements every single protocol I showed you on the previous screen from scratch. Uh, it's very fast and popular. Uh, it is used by LiveKit, and LiveKit is used by Spotify. And it has very large and supportive community. So why did we decide to rewrite Pion in Elixir? We already have a WebRTC implementation in Membrane, but I think it has a couple of drawbacks. First of all, our API doesn't really follow the official WebRTC API. And because of that, even if there are people familiar with WebRTC in other programming languages, it's pretty hard for them to jump into our project. We are focused on the server side. Uh, so I told that WebRTC is, is about peer-to-peer -peer connection. But even in peer-to-peer -peer connection, there is still a side which is controlling and controlled side. And we focus on the controlled side. We use third-party protocol implementations, and this results um, in sometimes lack of detailed understanding what is going on under the hood. And it's also hard for us to participate in the standardization process. And last uh, but not least, writing in a framework as an additional overhead. So we very often not only have to think about our WebRTC code, but also about framework code. And because of that, we decided to create a new project called Elixir WebRTC. Uh, so we are going to rewrite every single protocol uh, from scratch, except cryptography. Cryptography is going to stay in C. Um, and at the end of the day, you will be provided with uh, pure Elixir, WebRTC API, and membrane wrapper around this implementation. So you will still be able to use uh, our Elixir WebRTC with uh, already existing membrane plugins, modules, and protocols. Currently, there are two people working on this project, Lukasz Wala and me. We started working on it on a full time two months ago. And throughout this time, we were, we were able to implement STAN, TERN, and full ICE. We also started our work on RTP protocol. And we have a very simple, minimalistic web page where we put important information about the project. So um, that was a very short introduction uh, into our domain. And we can move to the library's presentation. So we will start with RHEL which is a shortcut from Relay. And RHEL is a TERN server, our own pure Elixir standalone TERN server. So what is a TERN server? TERN server is a pretty simple concept. It just forwards traffic from the one side to the other side. When we start a TERN server, it always has a um, listener socket, which is bounded to predefined, well-known IP address and port. Besides this, we have a client and a peer. A client creates an allocation, which is another socket. And whatever peer sends to this allocation, this data is going to be forwarded to the client. The other way around, when client sends something to the listener socket, this data is going to be forwarded via allocation socket to the peer. Uh, one client can communicate with multiple peers via single allocation. And what's also important is that uh, 
we can have multiple client, clients, but every single client is going to, to communicate via the same listener socket. So listener socket is a potential bottleneck here. We did a couple of benchmarks, so let's move to them. Uh, we have pretty simple benchmarking scenario. Uh, one connection consists of uh, one client and one peer. Client creates an allocation, and peer starts sending data uh, through this allocation to the client. Client then equal back data to the, to the peer. And the questions are how many such connections we are able to handle, how big bit rates we are able to handle, and what is uh, the impact of datagram payload size on our turn server performance. Testbed, we have two pretty big machines, Big Fish and Big Cow. Uh, big Fish uh, is 32 cores, 64 threads, it handles clients and peers, and Big Cow uh, handles our turn server. Those machines are connected with 10 gigabits per second uh, connection link. And the results. So we picked three, uh, three different uh, turn servers, of course, well, our own, Kotur, which is written in C, and is the most popular one available on the market for 10 years, and a turner which is written in Ireland. We started with a phone call live scenario, so we sent about 50 kilobits of data in one direction, uh, and we have 2,000 connection, connections, which results in 400 megabits of overall bitrate. Overall bitrate is a sum of total incoming and total outgoing bitrate on our turn server machine. Mm, the results are as follows. Well, it takes mostly between 20 and 30% uh, of CPU usage. There are some CPU spikes, but up to 50%. Coturn is stable mm, 10%. And in case of Turner, we were not able to set up such number of connections, but not because of CPU usage. I think that this some kind of configuration bug. Mm, however, I put a Turner here because in the last case scenario, it crashes, and I would like to talk, talk about uh, it later on. Uh, in this case, we have a lot of small messages because datagram payload size is about 150 bytes. So we ask a question, what happens if we keep the bitrate but we increase datagram payload size? And in the second case, we increased uh, datagram payload size from 150 to 1200. Uh, and uh, the results are much different. Well, it takes only between 2 and 4% of CPU usage, Coturn uh, a, li a little bit over 1%. Uh, and the last case scenario is a video call-like scenario. So we sent uh, 1,500 of kilobits uh, of data in one direction. It is enough to handle HD resolution. And the overall bitrate bit rate is over 5 gigabits per second. In case of RHEL, we uh, we are mostly between 40 and 55% of CPU usage. Again, there are some CPU spikes. Uh, Coturn is stable 15% and a turner crashes. But by crash, I mean that um, I, I don't mean CPU usage. They are just not able to handle such, uh, such throughput. So the maximal throughput on a turner is about one gigabit per second. And I hope I will explain this later on, why, why does it happen. Uh, here are some plots of our CPU usage. So as you can see, there are some CPU spikes. We are mostly below 50%. Uh, we think our assumption is that this is because of busy waiting. We are not 100% sure, but in general, when we uh, decrease, for example, number of messages, there are no CPU spike. When we generated a load about 90% of CPU usage on one of our smaller machines, there were also no CPU spikes. And here is another plot. As you can see, there are some CPU spikes up to 80%. Rel is publicly available. Uh, when I started working on WebRTC and I was told to do something with a turn server, I couldn't find anything uh, publicly available. So we created uh, one instance uh, and exposed it to you. So uh, everything you need to do to, to get access to it is to execute simple post request. You will obtain username, password, and uh, IP of our turn server. And you just copy paste this data to RTCP connection API. This is a JavaScript example, and everything should work. Okay, I mentioned that uh, listener socket is a potential bottleneck. And uh, at the end of the day, we were able to establish at least 2,000 connections, but the journey wasn't so easy. So we started with the architecture like this we have a simple, uh, we have a single listener process which is responsible for reading all incoming data from all clients and dispatching this data across allocations. A single allocation process has two sockets, 
uh, allocation socket and a reference to the listener socket. So whenever allocation process receives something uh, on its allocation socket, it can immediately pass, the da pass this data um, to the client using a reference to the listener socket. Thanks to this, we have only message passing from listener process to the allocation process. There is no message passing from allocation process to, to the listener process. It's also important that binaries in Erlang above 64 bytes are stored on a global heap, so at the end of the day, we don't copy a lot of data. However, this solution doesn't scale well. We started our test on eight core machine, where we were able to establish uh, something around 500 connections, uh, and everything worked pretty smoothly. So we moved to the 32 core cores machine, and uh, we tried to set up 2,000 connections, and we failed. Um, we, uh, we noticed that there is a packet loss, and the reason was that our listener process was not able to read incoming messages fast enough. Uh, so incoming datagrams were just dropped out because they couldn't fit into sockets buffer. So at this stage, we knew that we need to create uh, more listener processes that are going to be bounded to the same uh, IP address and port. Oh. And uh, and yeah, but we were also curious how many connections we are able to handle on a single listener process. So experimentally, we found out that around 750 connections, that's the maximal number. I'm talking about those small phone call-like scenarios. Mm, but the problem was that our system was stable for an initial 15, 20 seconds. Uh, and after that time, CPU was increasing from 15 to over 90% of CPU usage. So we started debugging. Uh, debugging, and we, we found out that there is probably a bug in Erlang virtual machine. We had to move from our INET backend for Gen UDP module to, to, the, socket, to the socket backend. That solved the problem, uh, so, so we could start working on making our listening process more parallel. And the final architecture look, looks like this. We have multiple listener processes. We use reuse port option for socket. So when you use reuse port option for socket, you can create multiple sockets bounded to the same IP and address. And operating system kernel under the hood uh, is going to uh, split incoming traffic across all uh, listener sockets. So we get load balancing out of the box. We are also pretty lucky because this option was introduced in OTP 26, so the newest one. But again, uh, there is a small bug when you try to use reuse port option in GenUDP, and uh, GenUDP just raises. So we needed to switch from GenUDP to socket module. And the difference between GenUDP and socket module is that socket module is a tiny wrapper around POSIX API. So you have to create socket manually, bind it manually, uh, set some options, and then you can start receiving and uh, sending data. That's not a big deal, but uh, just mentioning. So finally, we got pretty, pretty decent architecture, and we, and we were able to set up 2,000 connections. But when we tried to set up 3,000 connections, we once again failed. It turned out that our telemetry metrics uh, Prometheus library uh, is generating pretty big load. So for the time of benchmarks, we needed to turn off our, our telemetry. We are not sure whether this problem uh, is in the library itself or, or in a run virtual machine. But yeah, we'll, we'll debug this for sure. And so here are bugs we found. I'm mentioning this because if we stop testing on eight core machine, we will never discover those, uh, those bugs. And I think that's pretty important to test at a really big scale. Uh, only, only then you can see whether your system really scales uh, correctly. And speaking of debugging around virtual machine, you can for sure use a pretty easy uh, Pretty, pretty easy in usage uh, tools like Observer CLI or Erlang Crash Dump, and they are very helpful. Uh, but in our case, we needed to use something more specialized. So there is Perf and LCNT. LCNT is, is the log profiler. So, uh, but to use it, you have to recompile Erlang virtual machine. So we will focus on Perf. Perf is operating system uh, mar uh, operating system tool that allows you, or at least in our case, we use it to. Uh, determine which functions are called most frequently, and I think that its usage is very easy, and this tool is also pretty OP, so uh, every, uh, we, we have to start with starting our Erlang virtual machine with jperf true flag. Thanks to this, when we get the report, we are going to, um, to, to, rest, to, to get uh, function names and not just memory addresses. Then we record our 
uh, operating system PID for let's say 10 seconds and we call perf report. And as a result, we, we get a call hierarchy. So you can see which functions are called most frequently. In our case, there are a lot of calls, sys calls and calls to fast user mutex. So there probably is some, uh, some, some problem with, uh, with using mutexes here. This dump is, uh, was taken uh, from INET backend after the, the possible bug happens. And I have a short example, so I would like to, to show you how, uh, how our use port option works. So we'll move to the, our big fish uh, machine and we'll try to generate some, some load on our publicly available uh, 10 server. So I'm going to create 400 connections. Uh, as you can see, connections are uh, created and we can move uh, to our telemetry dashboard to see what happens. So we have here uh, eight, eight listeners. Uh, they are bounded to the same IP address and port. And incoming traffic, as you can see, uh, is split across those listeners. Maybe not equally. I'm not sure why not uh, fully equally. But in general, this solution allows us to create more connections than using just one listener. We can wait uh, for a couple of seconds to see how it looks like. Yep, so that's, that's how the load balancing done by operating system looks like. And speaking of packets, we have between, I think, 2,000 and 2,000, uh, almost 3,000 uh, packets per second. Uh, so uh, in case of one listener, I, I remember that the maximal uh, number of packets per second was about four, uh, 40,000. If you take our rel server, you will get um, those, those metrics and the Grafana dashboard out, out of the box. Uh, so you don't need to do anything special. And I think that's also why Turnal crashes. So they use just a single listener. And because of that, uh, they are not able to handle such, uh, such a big loads. So takeaways from our turn server. First of all, test at a really big scale. Uh, automate benchmarks and deployment. The more configuration options, the better, and provide telemetry at first stages of your project. Uh, I think pretty obvious things, but, but yeah, uh, they were very helpful for us. I think that's all when it comes to the turn server, and we can move to the ICE protocol. So we use turn server when we are not able to establish peer-to-peer -peer connection. And ICE protocol tells us how to establish peer-to-peer -peer connection. So. Uh, before we move to the ice itself, we have to answer the question, how does the in internet work? <laughs> and uh, in most cases, we have a client, which is in a private network, and server, which is in a public network. And client wants to communicate with server. So client sends a request. It creates a binding in its NAT device from private to public IP address. And thanks to this, server can send its response to our public IP address. And this response is going to be forwarded by, by, the, need, uh, by uh, the NAT device to our client. It's important that server can never initiate the connection uh, because it doesn't know our public IP address. And even if, he, if it knew our public IP address, there is no mapping in our NAT device, so any traffic will be discarded. So there are at least two purposes of NAT, security and port saving. And how we can establish a connection where both peers um, are in private networks. So to do so, we have to use first party server called stun server. And we start with client one. So client one executes a request to the stun server. Thanks to this, it creates a binding. And stun server replies with our public IP address. Uh, the other side does exactly the same. So at this stage, we have uh, on, on both sides, we have mappings between private and public IP addresses. And we also know uh, what are our public IP addresses. And we use third party server called signaling server to exchange those uh, public IP addresses. And at the end of the day, we can try to send data. Mm, that's pretty complicated. There might be multiple addresses that the other side might want to try to use uh, to establish connection, and those candidates are those IP addresses are called candidates, and the process of gathering, of obtaining those addresses is called gathering. Um, yep, and XICE is our pure Elixir implementation of ICE protocol. 
So I will list features we currently support. So we are compatible both with aggressive and regular nomination. We support role conflict resolution, uh, a lot of uh, different types of candidates, transaction pacing, and keep alikes. I'm not going uh, into uh, details about those features, but uh, for those who are familiar with ICE, now you know what you can expect from our implementation at this stage of the project. And I also ho have a pretty, pretty short example about our ICE implementation. Mm, so together with our ICE implementation, we provide very simple signaling server. So I'm going to run it. And we, we have also two peers. So we are going to connect those peers to the signaling server and those peers will try to establish connection and send some data. So I'm starting uh, the first one peer and the second one peer. And as you can see, they're trying to establish connection and once they establish connection, they send some data. I'm going to stop this now and we are going to take a look at our logs. So uh, when the other peer joined, we, we are starting our ICE, uh, ICE connection. We start gathering our candidates and we move to the checking state. Checking state means that the other side sent us some uh, candidates and we are checking whether there is a connection. Uh, after some time, we move to the connected state. Once we move to the connected state, we can start sending data. But the difference between connected and completed state uh, here is that in connected state, we are still looking for better network path. And once we find better network path, we just pick it. After some time, in this example, we, we send data after moving to the completed state. And as you can see, after some time, we, we receive some data. So let's, let's go back to the presentation and frequently ask questions. So when I was at my university, I discovered this site, which is um, pretty ugly, but the, the content is really quality. Uh, there's some frequently asked questions about RTP protocol, and uh, I wanted to create something similar about ICE, so we created also pretty ugly page, which is frequently asked questions about ICE. And what is the purpose of this site? So RFC documents in general are, are very, very well written, uh, but while they do tell you how to implement something, they very often don't tell you why something was designed in such a way and not the other way. And because of that, very often when we implement something, we don't fully understand how something might happen. Uh, so not to waste time, we just write down, uh, write down some questions. And once we find the answer, we are also writing this answer here. And takeaways, take care of your logs. That's very important because at the very early stages of our project, we very often put uh, raises in our code. So whenever we um, were not sure whether something might happen or not, we were just raising. We were also putting some very descriptive logs. And when something unexpected happens, our program just stops and we can analyze the situation and of course answer frequently asked questions about ICE. And the fact that you implemented something doesn't uh, really mean that you understand this. And you last library, we are going to talk about today is, is STAN. So STAN is, um, is used both by TAN server and ICE uh, protocol. Uh, it is a tool, uh, it's, it is a base for those protocols. So it can be used, for example, for determining our public IP address, keeping NAT bindings alive, uh, doing so-called connectivity checks and stuff like this. Uh, let's take a look once again at this diagram. So when we want to obtain our public IP address, client sends so-called binding request. And um, server, server re replies to us with binding response. And server can do this because when binding request arrives to the server, it, a server receives this binding request from our public IP address. So binding response includes our public IP address. Those two messages, binding request and binding response, are most frequently uh, are used most frequently, and uh, because of that, we did also a couple of benchmarks. How much time do we need to encode and decode those those messages? But before we move to the benchmarks, I would also like to show you our API. So how we can create a simple binding request message. Uh, we have message new. We just pass our type to the message new. We can encode this message, and that's everything. Then we just send this message to publicly available uh, Google uh, Stan server. 
we receive some response, uh, we decode this response and go and we get mapped address, which is our public IP address. And benchmarks. So we took three different uh, WebRTC implementations, Elixir WebRTC, IORTC, which is implemented in Python, and, Py and Pion, which is implemented in Go. And we are going to start with binding request encodes. So how much time we need to encode binding request. In case of Elixir WebRTC, we are over two times slower than Pion. And, uh, but we are faster than IORTC. Uh, in case of binding request decode, uh, well, I have no idea what IORTC does in this time, but they need over two microseconds to decode binding request. In our case, we need just 150 uh, nanoseconds and Pion just nine. And binding response and code, once again, uh, Python implementation needs uh, almost uh, eight microseconds. I don't think we have a bug in our benchmarks uh, because the code is very simple. Uh, it's also publicly available. Uh, when it comes to Elixir WebRTC and Pion, those, those results are pretty similar. We just need about 400 nanoseconds. And the last benchmark is new transaction ID. So how much time we need to create, um, create generate new transaction ID. When we send binding requests, we need to generate this uh, transaction ID. When we send binding response, we just use um, transaction ID from the, from the request. And in this time, this time, Elixir WebRTC was the slowest implementation. IORTC and Pion was pretty similar. Takeaways, uh, don't optimize too early, but I think that's pretty obvious too. And if you want to know whether you are handling binaries correctly, uh, you can run uh, error compiler options and pass their bin opt info and it will print some useful information. Future plans. So we already started working on RTP and RTCP. Uh, we are going to transfer some already existing libraries from Membrane Framework to Elixir WebRTC, like XDetailS um, or XDP, and we we hope to get first uh, peer connection skeleton version in four months. After this time, we hope we will be able to receive and send media over Elixir WebRTC. Yep, and uh, that's all I think. Uh, I thought we will need more time, but if there are any questions, I will be uh, happy to answer them. Okay. So thank you very much.